Okay guys, in this video segment we're going to talk about electrical conduction and kind of move on to the next few slides in our notes. So, when you have a solution and you dissolve a solute into a solution, one of the things that may or may not happen is that that solution can conduct electricity. So, when it does conduct electricity, we call those substances electrolytes. All right. Now, not everything can be an electrolyte. Some things are electrolytes, some things are not electrolytes. And we actually have three categories for them. So the first category is a strong electrolyte. If you're a strong electrolyte, that means when you dissolve that substance in solution, it's going to ionize. Now, the only type of compound that can ionize is an ionic compound. So to be a strong electrolyte, you have to be an ionic compound dissolved into water. Okay? And we're going to be talking about dissolving in water here um, for this process only because we're really dealing with aqueous or water-based solutions in this slide. Second category is weak electrolyte. If you're a weak electrolyte, you only partially ionize. Now, partially ionizing doesn't mean it's a different compound. It's still an ionic compound. It's just that that particular ionic compound only partially divides up. What it means is sometimes it splits into ions, sometimes it doesn't. So there are ionic compounds out there that completely ionize, and there are ionic compounds that partially ionize. Your partially ionized ones are going to be like your weak acids, your organic acids, those kind of compounds, and we'll spend more time on them when we get to our acid-base unit, actually. As a result, you don't get as good a conduction, because conduction is based off of how many free-moving electrons you have. The third category is a non-electrolyte. This is a substance that will not ionize in water. Okay? Now, it still has to dissolve in water, so it cannot be a nonpolar substance. Okay? We're not talking about nonpolar here. Your non-electrolyte would be a polar molecule, so things like sugars, and alcohols. Um, those things are your polar molecules. Um, they dissolve in water because they're polar, but they don't break down into ions, so they will not conduct electricity. A nonpolar substance doesn't dissolve in water, so it wouldn't meet really any of these categories in terms of dissolving in water. However, if you did have a nonpolar substance dissolving into a nonpolar solvent, again, there would be no ionization there, so you would have a non electrolyte in that category also. Now, to give you an idea of what we're talking about here, if we take a look at this website, we see that we have uh, a light bulb set up with a little switch to a battery into a solution. So if I fill the solution up with, let's say, nitric acid, okay? Uh, actually, let's just go to a salt. So sodium chloride. Let's fill the solution, and let's bring the volume up. 120 milliliters, and let's make this really concentrated solution, and let's connect the current. Okay? We see the light bulb lights up really brightly, okay? so that's a really strong conductor. Um, if we disconnect and we go to, let's say, a weak acid, such as acetic acid, and we bring the volume up, and we keep the concentration, now let's leave it up, see what happens, and we connect it. Notice how the light bulb doesn't light up as bright because this is a weak electrolyte. So even though we use the same amount, acetic acid only partially ionizes. It still ionizes, it's still ionic, but only partially. So it doesn't light up the light bulb as bright because less current will flow. Now if we go to another example, um, I don't think any of these here are non-electrolytes. Let's try ammonia. I think it's a, it's a weak electrolyte also. Yeah, ammonia is still a weak electrolyte because this will still partially ionize. So in this particular applet, everything that we have here um, are going to be at least uh, a weak electrolyte or a strong electrolyte. There's nothing on here that is a non-electrolyte in this example. So if we go back to our keynote now, those are your different types of electrical conduction. Okay? It's one way that we can determine what is going to happen to a solution when you create those solutions. Now, in class, we're going to do a conductivity, acti a conduction activity, actually, where we're actually going to have you guys use conductivity probes and test some different solutions in there. So that's going to be something we'll be doing in class. Now, when we talk about conduction, um, the next kind of topic we want to roll into is how fast something dissolves. So there are three things that affect the speed of dissolving. We're not talking about how much yet. We're talking about how fast we can get something to dissolve. Those three topics are surface area, agitation, and temperature. Okay. Now, all three of these factors come down to one thing. 
they're all based on how do you get more collisions to happen between the water molecule and the salt or the water molecule and the polar molecule okay so we want to increase collisions to increase the speed of dissolving so for surface area if you crush it up and make as much surface area as possible you now have more spots for collision to happen more spots means more collisions means faster dissolving agitation if you physically just stir it what happens there is you're actually moving water molecules that would normally be further away from the crystals closer to them and you're actually moving the water molecules that have already dissolved crystal away and you're keeping an even concentration always so by physically stirring you're actually providing a better system for more collisions to happen so again you get more collisions now temperature is all about kinetic energy so if we raise the temperature the particles will be moving faster if they're moving faster well the faster they are the more collisions that they can have happen also the faster they move the more energy they have so more of the collisions will have enough energy to start splitting apart the crystals within those crystal lattice so all three a little bit different ways but all three generate more collisions if you increase them so if you increase surface area increase agitation or increase temperature now if you want to slow this down you'd opposite you would do the opposite so you'd want to have the least amount of surface area you would not want to stir it and you want to make it as cold as possible in terms of slowing the process down that brings us into this idea of saturation or what is saturated versus what is unsaturated okay so the term saturated means basically maxing out the amount of solute that, a dissolve, that can be dissolved into a solution. Okay, This is a qualitative value. It's not quantitative. It's qualitative. If you're unsaturated, then you have less than the maximum. Now, there is a special case where you have to be super saturated. When you're super saturated, what happens is we take a solution and we saturate it at high temperature. Okay, So most solid solute solutions, as you warm them up, they're solubility is going to increase. So you actually can dissolve more solute at high temperature than low temperature. So what we do is we make it high temperature, we saturate it, and then we just let it cool down slowly, allowing the solute to stay in solution. For compounds that can supersaturate, what happens as they cool down, they stay locked in solution. What also happens is normally when they cool down, it releases energy. So because they're not recrystallizing, and they're staying in solution, they're not releasing the energy that normally happens. So as a result, they hold in some extra potential energy that can be used later. Okay? Now, only certain solutes can do this. Of those solutes, the one that is probably best at doing that is sodium acetate, and we'll see a video of that in a second. And one thing you need to make sure you do is you do not want to disturb the solution or change the temperatures too fast, because if you do that, then the supersaturation will not work. Okay. So if we take a look, here's kind of an image of a supersaturated solution and to test it or to have the supersaturation break and fall apart we add a seed crystal. Drop that crystal in, as soon as it hits the solution the other crystal that should be undissolved or should be in the crystal form grow kind of off that crystal and as a result we actually get the supersaturation to break and it releases. The other cool thing that happens as this releases all these extra crystals and they grow you actually get a lot of energy to be released, so this, this gets very hot, and it releases a lot of energy. Here's a video of the same process. The flask contains a supersaturated solution of sodium acetate in water. A small crystal of sodium acetate will be added to the solution. Focus your attention on the portion of the solution to which the crystal is added. Here is the process again in slow motion. So you can see why we call this falling out of solution. Because as soon as that seed crystal hit the surface, it started to force the other sodium acetate that was in supersaturation to crystallize on it. And it literally kind of grows across that solution, um, almost like a chain reaction event, like our fission reaction was, where one causes two or three more, which causes even more and more and more, and it spreads out across the entire solution. And there you can kind of see the falling effect the best.
Okay. Now, if you need to determine the saturation of a solution, really the only thing you need to do is have one extra crystal of your solute. So if you want to figure out if something is saturated or unsaturated or supersaturated, what we do is we add a few crystals or just one crystal of the unknown sol solute. When you put that crystal in, one of three things will happen. If it dissolves, your solution was unsaturated. Okay. If it sits on the bottom and does not do anything, it was saturated. And then if it causes a large amount of other particles to fall out of solution, we know it was supersaturated. Okay? Now, in all three cases, if it dissolves, well, you're unsaturated. You can keep adding more to make it saturated. If it's saturated, you could filter this to get rid of that extra crystal, and then now you know you have a saturated solution. If you cause all the extra stuff to fall out, well, that's easy to fix, too. All you have to do is heat it back up, dissolve it again, and you can re-supersaturate it. So in all three cases, you can kind of fix uh, the effect of adding the extra crystal if you want to reuse that solution in the future. Okay. Now, that saturation, in our next segment, we're going to talk about how much you can dissolve in terms of a quantitative measure, talking about solubility. So we're done for this segment. Thank you.